Hello, my name is Adam Bean and welcome to the 62nd edition of Airhex TV. So now let's start with the topics. So very first, um, so the uh, I also put the uh, web um, web Airhex online, so you can register for the um, for the um, how to call it no frameworks uh, building PWAs and SPAs with plain JavaScript CSS. Uh, three and uh, web components workshops the first is the beginner one and then advanced one so um we could even we will even do a fancy stuff like uh, build it installable applications and so forth and of course we have the um, ordinary air hacks winter edition and this time is going to be cloudy or uh, we'll at least talking talking about clouds so okay done now the next topic is um about the Java F, um, Java X, Java X namespace discussion, and uh, actually wrote a blog post about that. And um, what surprised me is the uh, amount of news. So what happened is, um, so actually from the beginning, as uh, Oracle donated the sources to Eclipse uh, Foundation to Jakarta E, it was uh, from the beginning clear, or um, it was at least. Uh, for Reza Raman, always clear that the Java Java X namespace is going to be locked because uh, Oracle maintains uh, copyright on it, and uh, there were attempts to uh, to open that. And uh, from the beginning, it was always clear, or always clear, this was the situation that this Java 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 X is frozen, and the new stuff is going to be released under the. Jakarta E namespace and the uh, old stuff remains Java Java X, which I never liked because we have a um, mess then because the Java E application will comprise Java X dot JMS and Jakarta E dot JMS and probably org microprofile uh, something. So um, what what happened now? Now it's clear. Uh, this Java, it is the, the Java X is not going to be donated to uh, to to Jakarta E, and uh, what uh, I wrote a short blog post, and uh, in my opinion, this is actually a good thing. Thinking about this, because after 20 years, we can completely get rid of Java X and replace it with Jakarta E, which uh, sounds uh, more fresh, and uh, we have a clear cut. So we see, okay, now we have to know the new truly open source world with uh, the new stuff and this is the old stuff also no nothing prevent uh, so now so i've wrote that there were a few uh, tweets uh, which uh, wrote yeah um, uh, you always preach you know jakarta e6 is going to be compatible we trust you and now <laughs> oracle or we are forced you know to recompile the application if it comes to that, uh, we will only have, or only, you will have to rename the package. So you will have to replace Java X uh, with Jakarta e. This is, I would say, fairly simple operation. And this could be done by IDEs or a search and replace or Java agent. So this is fairly simple, um, I would argue. And, uh, and it happened once every, so once after 20 years. So the first time, something got renamed, which I don't think this is that big deal. And at the beginning of Java, we had something similar already. So uh, this Comsan swing was renamed to Java X swing. So there was uh, already an example about that. So now, nothing prevents application server vendors to support both. They, they could actually support the Java X and the Jakarta E at the same time. And uh, so this could happen. And um, so I don't think that this is that dramatic. And what I, what I see in practice is the projects are not compatible because lots of external dependencies. This is what most projects struggle with, is all dependencies, let's say, Hystrix and something like this, and they have to, you know, this is like the recent example, and they have to remove it and replace it with something else. So the problem is you have st structural changes or you will have to rename lots of classes. With that, this is just, you know, more syntactic or, yeah, you know, syntactic. This is more mechanical change, only a namespace changes, but nothing else. Okay, so um, then next topic. And um, oh, next topic, I released a new podcast and, and I think even uh, three podcasts since last time. Is it true? 21st April, yes. There was one podcast about Kafka versus GMS MQ at a chat with Andrew Schaufield, uh, Chief Architect Event Streams at IBM. And 
the funny outcome will come uh, later to this is so I estimated you know to put Kafka in production with stress tests and so forth one to two weeks with you know clustered environment and uh, I, I was too optimistic so uh, and you said okay uh, said uh, in my case I, I think I would estimate it in several weeks um, which I I think it is uh, it is reasonable so this was uh, the, the one podcast the other podcast was interesting um, I was approached by a company which um, um, which um, claimed, or this is actually true, to use AI for unit test generations. And I thought it's an interesting topic. And I had a really nice chat with James Wilson about unit integration system tests, stress tests, and at the end about the products, uh, Div Blue and, uh, and uh, AI and unit tests. So it could be interesting if you're interested in, um, to you, if you're interested in Java E and and testing. And the very last one about Java native databases actually released yesterday. This is a podcast with Marcus Kett and the story was interesting. I was invited to a JCon conference and uh, by a guy called Marcus Kett and he was like a pro Java guy. I didn't knew him very well. I met him at Java One or Code One, a nice guy. And it turned out he's a CTO or CEO of a company called MicroStream. And they have an interesting product like Hibernate imported with a richer data model and Rapid Clips and an IDE built from scratch and ported from Swing to Eclipse. And now they have uh, um, Java native data store or database, which also in, uh, seems interesting. And I had a chat with him. And uh, yeah, it's an interesting story. It was, I, I hope it was an interesting episode. So now about Airhex FM. Okay, now I think we covered a lot. Now the first story is Vasi. Let's make it a little bit bigger. Uh, Vasilai Vasilai O or Vasila I O. Ask me, is there any real benefit to mark all the response endpoints as singleton? Short question. No, I would always prefer request scoped or at stateless. And someone is actually interesting link uh, measured that. Uh, and uh, uh, four years ago, and what they did is they, they measured per request and singleton, uh, singleton uh, performance, and uh, singleton was up around 1.5% faster, so it really doesn't matter. So I would say it is not uh, worth the optimization. And now he found that in my Lightfish project, I use singletons, and I think back then, so Lightfish is fairly old, I would say almost 10 years, I think, and um, back then, uh, Lightfish ran on uh, an old Glassfish, and I, I remember there were some issues with dependency injection. This could be one reason. And another reason was, in one point of time, I saw a, 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 a committers, a, a large amount of committers really committed like crazy to the Lightfish projects, and it turned out that it was government of, uh, government of Canada, and they wanted to use light, or they used Lightfish in production, and I let them just do, so, okay, do whatever you like. Uh, I just have my part, and I think even they could introduce that singleton. So long story short, uh, don't use at singleton on, on, uh, on resources because uh, you know, for 1.5% performance uh, difference, it doesn't make any sense. So now the next one, how can I produce inject on the CDI bin into a resource endpoint? Uh, based on deployed application server. So uh, you will have to deploy to, to detect which application server it is, so how to do this. Um, you could use, for instance, JMX for it, because uh, different application servers uh, register different JMX beans. You could use uh, REST service and, uh, and you know, uh, go to localhost 8080, for instance, and uh, see in, into the header, for instance, uh, Payara, uh, Payaro releases a, a, a header, this is badass fish, I think, and, um, and uh, just detect it. By the way, this could be actually an interesting library, a Java utility which detects on which application server the application is running. Um, yeah, and then with a simple if-else, you can, you can implement different implementations depending on application server. If it doesn't have to be automatic, you can, of course, use a bin 6 ml alternatives um, or stereotypes and depending on application server just uh, just you know uh, switch between application servers but it wouldn't be automatic is there any way to pay for your courses by bank transfer i don't have a credit card it's hard to tell because uh, i fully rely on vimeo and whatever runs with vimeo it will also uh, or whatever vimeo is using in your country um, I, this is not my service, um, so I, I just vimeo.com. This is um, who is responsible for selling my courses, 
And if it's really that hard, just ping me behind the scenes and uh, I will try to do something about that. Um, I think PayPal or something should work as well. Okay. And if you if you uh, would like to attend the uh, workshops in Munich, um, we don't even accept credit cards, so we will send you an invoice. <laughs> okay. Now, Sern Jack, S R N Jack, ask me, I have a question about the mythic events in microservices. I understand that XA transactions are not desired. I mean, uh, not desired, they are too complex. And if you would use uh, uh, XA transactions, um, you, you really will have to know what you're doing and you will spend a lot of time testing. So, uh, And then, which I used to achieve exactly once delivery in Java E. So I'm thinking about at least once strategy, right? What is the best way to accomplish that using Java and uh, MicroProfile? My current solution is to store event in the local database. The timer triggers processing that event and sends it to message broker. Is is there a better solution? I see this disadvantage in timer because of delayed processing. What you actually did um, is very similar what JMS would do. This is um, if you use a um, a persistent queue. This is exactly what would happen here. So you would. Um, you would uh, the in the first transaction the message is going to be stored in a, in a, in a local store in the in the upcoming transaction immediately reread from a database and and try to to be redelivered so very similar what you did with the persistent timer so um, yeah this is how it would be delivered at least once strategy or at least once it's not once and only once so at least once yes. Um, so JMS would be a natural thing to do. Now the next one, Tani Tunji Tunji Dear, ask me, hey Adam, how would one implement Java e Jakarta e security assuming the identity identity store is meant to fetch principal details from the database? What what server directory does one copy persistence XML and SQL script that is loaded by persistence XML? So first the uh, two questions. The first one is identity store and fetch principal. If you are using Java 8 security identity store, this is actually incredibly easy because what you get is you get the, um, for instance, the credentials coming to you with HTTP authentication mechanism, for instance, and uh, you get the username, which is unique. So you could go to, uh, to the data store, fetch the data, then create your own principle, which actually inherits from the Java X principle, and then you can just return the principle. So we did it recently in our project. We replaced the principle with our own principle, which had own methods. So it is a straightforward way to do this. What you could also do in, um, without Java 8 in Java 7, you can produce a principle, let's say uh, Tanji principle, your principle. And um, so if someone injects, for instance, Tanji principle, you could, in a, in a Java class, inject the real principle, fetch the username, then go to database, fetch a tree of objects, do whatever you like, and with the tree of object, create your own principle and inject that. So this both are working. So with Java 8, it is more or less transparent. And uh, let's see whether we can find um, Java EE8 identity store sample. I actually wanted to wrote that but at no time. So uh, let's see what they are doing. Uh, so this is the validation result. And somewhere, so this is an example from Java e GitHub. Um, somewhere they will have to create their own. They didn't. But um, in this tutorial, so this is identity, define user, specify. So this is the first part, but the second part is easier. You can actually create your own principle which inherits from the Java X security principle and then do whatever you like. Okay, but you search for Java E identity store and you will find a solution. If not, ping me and I will wrote, write something on my blog. So what is what server directory does one copy persistence XML is not in a server directory, it is in war directory. And uh, if you I think Adam being Simplest possible JPA. JSF JPA component. Let's see what I did then. So this was 
and the entity manager so this was a component so i had a series about simple as possible whatever um and there should be a lots of examples So and where and you have the persistence XML. So I described that, and the persistence XML has to be in the meta in folder in jar, and in wars it has to be a thing, a web app web inf, and in jars in meta inf, and if you're using NetBeans, just put in the right location. So uh, take a look on that. So persistence XML do not reside on the server. It 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 ships with a war. So. Yeah, and the um, uh, embedded H2 is a part of the application server, and um, and how would this would work? This H2 embedded or DB would be would ship with server with the uh, data source connection pool from the application server. The data source is going to be injected to to your application in the persistence XML. You would specify the data sources how it works. You wouldn't you wouldn't ship the uh, H2 or, or Apache with your application rather than you will install it on the server. So uh, Dyna Bogdan asked me, currently I'm developing software using Java and Spring Boot, but I like Java E and I want to try more and maybe move with Java E into production. That's interesting. Um, what, what happened actually, I'm back from the conference called JAX. It is uh, one of the largest, of, I would say, I think the largest uh, Java conference in Germany, in Mainz. And um, I, what I did, uh, I delivered two sessions. One was about how to structure Java E applications. And the first one was uh, about actually nothing. I just hacked from scratch a Java E application with micro profile. And at the end, I used Quarkus and, uh, and OpenShift to deploy this. And, um, but after the show, they came to me and, and asked me, you know, we have uh, um, a few people, we are running Tomcat. Um, and now we saw how productive you are. How how expensive or how hard is it to port back our Tomcat application to Java E? And uh, the others uh, asked me, you know, why your code is so simple? It's like, oh, because it's Java E and MicroProfile, so you are not alone. I want to ask you about using Kafka in Java E application. Is there any API provided by the Java E such as Spring Kafka? The Spring Kafka is a very easy to understand API despite the very complicated Kafka configurations. Thank you a lot. Exactly, Kafka configurations. So uh, the problem is the Kafka configurations is, um, I would say Kafka is very popular and uh, lots of, I got lots of questions about Kafka, but if I show what you will actually have to do to run Kafka, it becomes n no more that, that interesting. So this is the broker configs from Kafka. If you take a look how many, this is the whole table, which you will not have to understand, but at least, either trust the default values or, you know, test that. And you will have to configure it somehow. I mean, this is this is huge. And uh, what usually happens in projects, developers just focus on using Kafka in a, in a single shard without any cluster. And then, you know, shortly before uh, before production, it, it blows up because, um, because no one thought about running Kafka in a cluster. And um, so I would say if you really would like to use Kafka, uh, set up the cluster first, uh, perform some stress tests, and then think about application logic. But in some project, Kafka is already in place. So let's say if you have already Kafka, just go for it because usage is fairly simple. So now, if you search, for instance, for Kafka, Java E, you would usually find a JCA connector. Um, Kafka, Java E connector. And... Uh, Exactly. This is cloud connectors from Payara. And if you even search for Kafka, so Payara is one, CDI. There are even talks at Java 1 how easy it is to uh, introduce Kafka. And we have here from AeroGear, this is uh, uh, Matthias Wessendorf, I think, what is behind the AeroGear. Exactly. Um, he wrote also a Kafka configuration. And uh, so I would say, if you already have a Kafka running, uh, there are lots of opportunities. So uh, search for Kafka CDI or Kafka Java E. JCA stands for Java Connector Architecture. So if using Payara, it comes uh, out of the box with uh, Kafka, um, Kafka uh, support. 
no idea whether this is easy or not, but I think it can be you know, easier. You have just receiver, string message, and consumer, and uh, your message gets gets consumed. Okay, I hope I answered your question. But uh, um, Kafka, the Java doesn't come out of the box with Kafka support. And what's also possible, the company Confluent provides JMS API for Kafka. So you could even you know, um, use uh, standard Java E JMS API to access Kafka. This would also work. So, Zen left, ask me, hello Adam, one of the typical thing in the distributed system is network failures, yeah, unfortunately. Th therefore, I say never, don't distribute if you don't have to. So, um, case one, stale DB connection in the connection pool and um, or a network error will fail the DB transaction, the repetition of the DB operation may be successful, yes or not? Yes, service-to-service -service communication, network failure, rest, no DB transaction involved, the repetition of service call, uh, call may be successful. Available solutions, so now he says, okay, there is an, uh, he says, annotation, retry on failure, uh, fail safe and micro fault torrents. First and second uh, additional dependency not a part of the platform, no integration with transaction manager, very true. And the third solution, Microsoft fault torrents, um, is uh, part of the platform, but not Java E. Uh, no idea if it is integrated with the transaction manager. So a uh, default tolerance is, um, is, how to call it, um, I think it doesn't matter uh, whether it is integrated with transaction manager or not because what usually happens is if um, if exception happens is where microprofile kicks in and the exception is a runtime exception, the transaction gets to roll back. And the only thing I can imagine is the retry mechanism which will retry several times and um, and then what, what I will do, let's say this retry mechanism would be a boundary and the control would be, uh, would, would be a POJO, then you can decide whether the POJO is annotated with a transaction attribute or transactional or not. So you can decide by yourself whether you would like to start transaction or not. So first, I would go with uh, the, uh, the third solution and I don't think that the transaction uh, manager integration makes sense and all because um, the fault torrents is what we have we have buckets we can retry we have fallback uh, we have uh, what else a circuit breaker and all these patterns are implemented actually as um, interceptors so it could be implemented as interceptors interceptors so they either will repeat um, the operation or not and whether the operation is transactional or not it it is really uh, doesn't does matter in this context so um and um what uh, and uh, the case one is nicely solved by the connection pool. So usually it is a job of connection pool to check whether the uh, connection is uh, is healthy. And usually you can even check before use. So it will be a slow or small performance hit, but this would work. And service to service communication network failure, uh, no DB transaction involved. Um, so whether you would would like to uh, to to retry or no, it really depends whether the REST service is idempotent or or not. And if the service is just idempotent on every on every exception, I would just retry. So now, Orlovsky Java Profi asked me. Also, uh, Orlovsky is uh, a freelancer, and he's concerned about Open JDK and patches. And uh, what he says is there are too many different Open JDK and JDK providers, and uh, what can happen is that uh, if they they patch they, their solution independently, we could get uh, um, uh, um, different or or independent uh, JDK streams. I think this is the concern here. And um, so, what to do about that? I would say so fixing. This was actually always true, right? Because uh, we had uh, IBM JDK, we had uh, Oracle JDK, and uh, do we have something else? There were the both big JDKs. Some project had um, Kafi in one project, and they could be they behaved differently for sure, performance-wise. But the uh, uh, but there was the same I would scale the same test suite. Which run against that. So first, uh, the uh, the test suite uh, is open, so all the JDKs could be tested with the same test suite, and of course, uh, subtle bugs are always possible. But what usually happens in commercial space 
ist, you, if you are running, for instance, Red Hat, you will take, you know, the uh, Red Hat JDK and the Red Hat JDK will, uh, and probably if you would run, let's say, Wildfly application server or JBoss, it would be tested uh, on the Red Hat JDK with all JBoss bugs. And, um, yeah, and uh, if you would use Open Liberty, this is IBM product, it would be rather tested right now, later, doesn't matter because IBM and Red Hat are one company, but it will run on, let's say, JNI from IBM. So um, I would say usually in commercial applications, the clients would run full stack. And uh, the full stack has to behave correctly, not just you know, one piece of the stack. And um, I think, yeah, I, I understand your concern. And um, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm not that concerned because most of my clients stick with one JDK. And, and over time, of course, they could be incompatible, uh, incompatible um, changes or patches but I think everyone should be interested to, uh, to, 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 to send the patches upstream because uh, I think no vendor is interested to maintain their own fork. Okay. Uh, so I don't think the Java platform becomes that fragile because most of my clients, if they have no idea what to choose, they use just open JDK. And if they have uh, uh, um, commercial support, that they pick whatever they have to. So this is how it looks right now. Sarend Rand asked me, I am writing an OAuth, OAuth client. What is the best practice? And, and the question is, what is the best practice to get a refresh token in Java? We need to fetch after get 401 on unauthorized or to cache the auth token and request for refresh token before timeout period. Is there an out-of-the-box library support? So... Uh, what uh, what happens is the refresh token is in the um, OAuth protocol and it works like that with the refresh token. Um, if the refresh token, um, 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 if the token expires with the refresh token, you can get a new refresh token and the new access token. I think the, the, the name is access token. Um, and so you, you get the, like refresh token and token rotation. And uh, so you are using like the access token is a high frequency token and the refresh token is low frequency token. And every uh, hour or two or is configurable, um, the uh, access token expires, and the, with the refresh token, you can you can reload the uh, or you can get both token token backs. So the question is uh, whether they should cache the token. You should cache the token for two hours, the uh, the refresh token, but not for longer, and the access token is shorter lived token. Uh, and is there? Uh, an out of box, out of the box library support. I mean, what I will do, I will take a look at Keycloak, and Keycloak, Keycloak, comes with um, client side connectors, and Keycloak even comes with servlet filters, and this is open source solution. So if you take a look at the servlet uh, filter, they have to rotate the tokens as well. So you can, there's an out of the box solution called Keycloak. And the other solution is uh, Forge Rock uh, Identity Manager or something like this. Um, yeah, a digital identity management platform. And this is this is based on Payara, and the other one is based on Whitefly. Okay. Uh, G. McCarthy asked me, I'm just wondering, if you were setting up an enterprise system, what kind of architecture would you choose? API, Gateway, Docker, Kubernetes, OpenShift, MQ, and so forth. Could you describe a high level how calls would flow through the system? I'm planning to move from an older monolithic application that communicates with many external systems to more flexible service-based flexible service based system. I have some ideas of what I would like to do and, um, and would be really interesting in hearing your thoughts. Um, yeah, uh, first, uh, if you are moving to somewhere, the question is why you are moving and whatever you don't like, improve it. But if you everything works, but you are say, okay, my system is just monolithic, don't, don't move because you're just monolithic. So there should be a reason to move. And uh, why you are moving, I will improve that. But the question is, if I would start from scratch, what I would choose? So Docker, no brainer or container. Um, Kubernetes? Um, yes, Kubernetes is a standard and it comes with lots of benefits because if you have a commercial application, Kubernetes comes with etcd and, um, and proxy and service and ingress, this is like uh, external route. And um, OpenShift is a Kubernetes distribution with nice uh, web client and OC. 
So I would choose Kubernetes or OpenShift for a larger application. Having said that, on my application server or my own server, I just use Docker. But uh, just for fun, I, I'm, I, I will probably introduce Kubernetes soon just because it's my leisure. But if this, um, yeah, and uh, right, right now I'm using Docker and Docker Compose on my server for, I would say, five years, at least five years. Uh, now, uh, for communication between services, I'm, I would use REST and OpenShift or Kubernetes. You don't need API gateway because you can just use logical service names um, uh, and in, inside a cluster and they get load balanced. So you, you, you can you know, name your, your service like a payment service, just payment. You don't have to resolve the IP address. So this is already solved problem. And um, API gateway usually is not needed at the beginning. Then MQ or JMS, uh, I would, uh, if you have JMS infrastructure in place, I would just use it. I wouldn't set up a, a JMS server from scratch. It's uh, a little bit easier, but uh, at least as com um, um, or similar complexity as setting up Kafka in a cluster. So it's also uh, somehow complex, which comes lots of testing. Why? Because Kafka and uh, JMS, you always need to you know one master, uh, and all these slaves are waiting until the master dies. And uh, um, Kafka uses Zookeeper, and the JMS servers use various uh, various uh, um, mechanisms to to achieve the same. For instance, uh, Whitefly uses HA Singleton or Infinispan or whatever, but you will have to set it up. So I would I would start with the simplest possible solution. It means Docker, uh, Thin Wars, um, then service-to-service uh, -service communication. Rest. I wouldn't start with asynchronous communication. Always synchronous communication then measure the performance and then improve. And if you would, um, for instance, deliver once and only once, then use JMS with persistent, uh, persistent storage, for instance. Okay, I hope that's all. And if you have an IoT system with uh, lots of data and you would like to buffer the events, then something like Kafka would be uh, interesting for that. But before you're using Kafka, I would take a look at Apache Pulse Pulsar. It's a really interesting modern alternative to Kafka, for instance. So, um, it's called Apache Pulsar, I hope. Apache Pulsar. And we'll talk about Pulsar in the cloud, cloudy air hex in, um, in, uh, in December. Okay, so we had that. So, uh, Jakarta writes to Java trademarks. I think we already covered that. And my opinion is I like the Jakarta E name and the namespace because back then... There was a Jakarta Apache project, uh, and Tom Kent and all the Java interesting st stuff was hosted on Apache. So therefore, I really like the Jakarta E name, branding, logo. So I think it's really fresh. So I don't care the ma that much about the Java X or Java namespace. The most important thing for me is simplicity and consistency. So what it means is if I get the new Jakarta e 8, 9, or 10, or whatever, I would like to have you know all the packages in one space. It should be obvious, okay? Whatever is, everything has to start Jakarta E. So in code review, if I look at the code, I see import Jakarta E, and all other imports are forbidden except MicroProfile, of course. So now, uh, next question, Dinesh, 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 right? So Dinesh asked me. It would be great if you share tips to understand existing code bases, uh, open and closed source, with less or no documentation, which is normal. So I actually don't don't read documentation in my code reviews. I look at the source code first. Most of the times, it fills information overload and loses interest in reading code. So I wouldn't just read the code because uh, for for fun. Usually, I always have to a reason to read the code, and this is more exciting but usually you are also a little bit on, under pressure but if i can only tell you uh, i perform lots of code reviews in jakarta ee or sorry jakarta EE, java e code reviews and what's uh, most important for me is first um, what actually happens behind the scenes and i try to uh, to, to to get a feeling what the project is doing by trying to read the names so high level no package names like uh, if this is, for instance, a airport, so I will look for airplanes, passengers. This is the first thing. And then what interests me, you know how the request flows through the system. So what is the boundary or the perimeter or API or whatever they have? So there should be, you know, um, what is the 
the, the, the ingress or incoming point of the, of the transaction and how it flows through the system. This is how I try to understand Java E applications. And then, of course, um, in code review, what I do is I, 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 I uh, think about, you know, is it the simplest possible solution? How many, you know, external libraries are superfluous? And uh, yeah, but, uh, but this is holding me back in contributing to open source code. Um, yeah, I, I mean, uh, most of my Java E projects on my GitHub are trivial, so you you could actually contribute. But this is what what I usually do. I create solution to my own problems and do not even expect any contributions. It's like more like you know, like my blog is my notepad, and let's say GitHub is for me like uh, you know personal garage, which is open but uh, yeah, still personal. So. And if you care about the project, there should be incentive. And uh, what you should do in open source, if you really would like, you know, to contribute back, run a lots of tests, and then you get a sense, you know, um, how how the project is working. And if you don't, still don't understand the uh, existing code base, but you are expert in the in the let's say in the in the business logic, I would you know change the code so it is more understandable. So lots of uh, open source projects are very old. And there is legacy code who no one understands anymore. So this is what I will do. So future of Jakarta E. I think the future of Jakarta E is really bright. So, but what should we all do is, is say, okay, now is clear cut, and since now everything is Jakarta E. So the clear cut is important. Not you know the endless discussion whether it's good or bad or whatever. Just do it, and and we are done, and then the the, the future is bright, because you know many people who who don't actually use Jakarta, it just they read the news, they have the impression that there's like, you know, uh, we have a huge trouble in the Jakarta E community, but actually nothing happened. So the issue is known for multiple years, and uh, now we know that we have to something to do about that. So it's, it's, I mean, Jakarta E, as was, the future is as bright as, as, as it always was, and with the renaming uh, to Jakarta E even brighter, because then we can rename the Jakarta E and we can also rename the names so there will be no more enterprise Java beans. We can uh, rename them to Jakarta beans. And uh, now we can say, you know, Jakarta beans are lightweight and EJBs were heavyweight and problem solved. <laughs> okay. Now, um, how do you, next, next question is, uh, how do you handle garbage collection of views code beans in GSF? In your projects, so uh, and they have uh, they have memory issues with view scoped, and um, and how how I do this. I was in a in so first uh, view scoped is not very uh, common in my project, so we used a lot of uh, request scoped in JSF, and recently more and more project are JavaScript, so we use uh, JSF for administration consoles and backend logic, and this is not as critical. And for the user user facing um, sites, we use usually web components. Or in the project which I so the last few years, we use lot lost um, view web components without any external frameworks. And um, what I did in the task force back then, uh, for instance, the Mohara uh, JSF runtime you could tweak a lot and you could actually, we were always improved the performance of about 50%, but there are trade-offs. You can, for instance, say where you would like to store the persistence on the client side or on the server side, and you can even compress the data sent over the wire, which will uh, we use more CPU, but um, this GSF uses more memory, but this was actually never, never a problem. So, um, and I don't know what it means a lot heap space in our application because, you know, heap space is extremely cheap. And uh, what I can tell you in one project, we I think there were two and a half thousand sessions which were open for eight hours or 10 hours. And the application ran on two gig or whatever. So two gig is a lot of heap space, but it's still, you know, like 10 euros in, 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 uh, in IT store. So... Uh, the question is, you know, what do you expect? So um, GSF will always take CPU and always take memory because the components reside on the server. And something like REST will pick, you know, no memory and will require no, almost no CPU because the whole UI model is uh, created on the, on the client. Okay, so big thanks. 
And next one, question about JavaX. It seems to be a forgotten thing in Java world because majority of applications are web. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah. So um, the problem is, you know, it really depends how motivated you are to uh, to learn this. So you can use JavaVix and OpenJavaX. If you know what you are doing, you can create great apps, but you have to be an expert. And in particular, high interaction hardware, card reader, credit card reader, QR reader, printer, GPS, and so forth. And what you mentioned here, card reader, credit card reader, QR reader, printer, you could actually implement a lot with web right now, with web Bluetooth, for instance, GPS comes off the box. So it really depends what you are doing. And I missed the productivity. So um, my um, project called Afterburner, so take a look at Afterburner. It, uh, it, uh, the productivity is almost like CDI. It, it supports uh, CDI-like injection. So you could use this in JavaX. So, um, so and, and the question is first, uh, what is my, what is my uh, question about that? I think with the first part, you could uh, implement that with web, absolutely. Productivity could be improved with Afterburner FX. So after, let's see how it, how it actually is doing. Afterburner FX. Um, yeah, exactly. And this is the, uh, the framework, which has um, 260 stars. It's uh, very popular. And uh, so take a look on that. And it comes with single dependency uh, view classes. Two of classes, I think. Meanwhile, there are almost almost four four classes, but uh, it, it supports uh, dependency injection out of the box and increases the product productivity. Um, Controls FX. Do you recommend some framework like Controls FX? It's really hard to tell because uh, I don't know. You know, if you're building hardware, how long your system is going to is planned to be in production? And the question is, uh, what happens if your system outlives the control FX? So uh, controls FX. So how well controls FX is supported? I will took a look. You know how many commits happened in the last years. So this is uh, really interesting, uh, or interesting input to you because if you are building something which will be integrated with the hardware and you ship it on the hardware, it's really hard to upgrade that, right? How do you think is the best way to communicate with the devices? Um, uh, reboot uh, remotely. So I would use REST. REST or HTTP like communication, REST or HTTP with JSON. I would not use RMI and would not use Corba. So go with REST or WebSockets. Thanks for all your work. I've made first four online training. I have made first four online training and don't miss any hacks and podcasts. So thank you for watching and thank you uh, for watching my trainings and podcasts and air hacks and greetings to Mallorca. So uh, yeah. Almost German island, right? So, um, so this is really hard to give you advice. But what I can tell you, um, this uh, web stuff, or so not only Java, but JavaScript stuff. There's also they are also very uh, low level already. There's a project I think is called uh, Johnny Five. Is it Johnny Five Jazz? Yes, Johnny Five. So they have JavaScript, Arduino, Robotics, IoT platform. So there is a lot of going on in the in the web space, and uh, my impression is that Java Vix is not as popular. So, final thoughts: If you are a Java expert, go with Java Vix. If you have to work with larger team, you know everyone has to go into Java Vix and know what they are doing. So this is actually what I would like to tell. So it's really hard to give you an advice. So Dempile asked me uh, when I try to inject microprofimatic like counted in a CDI bin with named. This is named. It got, it got an error. Cannot produce unserialized instances for injection into an injection point that requires a passivation capable dependency. And um, the CDI beans implement serializable. First, the CDI bean doesn't have to, to implement serializable. Um, and named is very unusual for a counted bean. So, what counted, counted you will put on a method, and named you will put on a class. And named makes only sense for JSF beans, for instance, because uh, yeah, only for that. Or you, if you will, you only for J Java server pages, JSPs, or JSF. Otherwise, named doesn't make any sense because it is a qualifier, which introduces a string which is not type safe and actually pointless. So I will rethink at named and actually wanted to try it before whether it really doesn't work. But um, if you put named on a class and counted on a method, it actually has to work. 
and uh, and named doesn't have to be serializable because uh, if it was session scoped, it has to be serializable. Just named, it is it is not a scope. This is a um, a qualifier. So it seems like a bug in your case. Now, Ivan, Tsarchich, I think, ask me. I tried uh, uh, some Quarkus I.O. with JavaScript frontend. No framework, no migration. Of course, if, if you want to take a look at uh, GitHub uh, Kicker. And uh, so, why not? So let's take a look on that. Where is my terminal here? Git. So my keyboard doesn't work. Uh, git clone or terminal frozen. So clone that and switch to IDE. Project groups junk, which is uh, my demo folder. And take a look at the POM first. This is a code review. So um, Quarkus, um, it uses uh, REST Easy, JSONB, which is interesting, JSONP, Hibernate ORM, MariaDB, and H2. The question why both? and the Maven plugin. So it looks right. And now we have games resource, players resource, ranking resource. So the first thing which I see is, uh, you have already three concepts and what I would expect. So first, what is lacking here, Zorchich is fine dot. I would call the application kicker. So I would use something like this. So application name is kicker. Oh, I actually wanted to create a folder, the new folder. So application name is kicker. And then we see already concepts. So you have concept games. And you have a concept players and rankings. So players, kicker dot players and uh, and rankings. 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 So and then what I will do, I will just go here this is the boundary refactor and we have the games and here would be also a boundary new boundary and this is going to be uh, player boundary just wanted to add a boundary new boundary exactly and this was players this would be players and why that? Because this is a small application, but I, I think in one point of time it will grow. And then you are start starting rankings boundary. So rankings boundary. So we have already that. So ranking exception, uh, ranking resources, rankings, uh, exactly. So the game would be, for instance, in the uh, package entity so this would be the games that would be the game package and probably even elo scores no quick no idea what elo means i have to admit i have no idea about soccer or kicker i, I guess kicker is soccer i would say uh, so we have entity game game resource players so i would put the player into players so your app is actually perfect as a BCE pattern. It is actually a canonical example. Entity, so this would be like this, and the entity would be player. And uh, then we would get another Java package. Uh, entity ranking. And the new game event looks good, would be in a uh, new game in games even the entity could be and elo scores how to tell what is elo scores let's see scores is somehow game related so we can just refactor that so now it looks really good so we have a kicker games players rankings so three concepts um, beautiful now kicker exception perfect so uh it is on uh 
top level because it can it can be reused by the three components and web application exception beautiful because what happens now if this exception occurs is automatically mapped to bad requests with this additional message perfect now take a look at the implementation games resource transactional request scoped path games so json object game the question is why not json b could be even simpler so if you could put you know json b object here it doesn't have to be json p rather than b you included the b anyway where is it here b so you could actually create an entity game with public fields and just reuse it here so this looks good uh, game is an entity perfect new game event is just an event player's resource so we have a create player which is void the question is why so player's resource if this is post um, actually what i would expect is 201 this is created with location header which points to the to the um, to the player this is the proper implementation get json players look good looks good the player named entity perfect so you see how simple Java E actually is. You can look at the code from a from a listener's or an Airhex TV attendee, and it's really easy to understand. And um, and um, yeah, this is also the question on how to perform a code review. Um, you are actually writing really good good code. So the entity manager and Elo scores they are not private, so it's very easy to test. You can mock them out. And the question is why this is application scoped. It doesn't have to be any scope, but uh, it could be application scoped. Ah, I, I, know, I know why. So you are right. It has to be application scoped because the ALO scores are kind of cache, and therefore this is the um, depending, dependent scope. So um, I actually forgot the question, but I can tell you the code looks, looks good. And what was the question? Uh, ah, uh, so, uh, if you time to review in end question, also I review the code now, and now is the question: How do I get a Java Java X EJB startup uh, with an CDI EJB, but with CDI? So um, this Quarkus was on a CDI event, which seems to work. IO Quarkus runtime startup event, but that is not part of the spec. So. I wouldn't bother with not par being part of the spec because, so as you probably saw, I recorded already several uh, screencasts about Quarkus, and the question is why I did it because uh, you know I'm not was never that excited about Thorntail and uh, Runtime, oh Runtime, Whitefly Swarm, but Quarkus seemed to be different, and the reason is Quarkus comes with significant added value. So first you get something like a skim jar, which uh, only contains the uh, business logic, your business logic, but it points to a jars from a different Docker layer, and in this Docker layer is frozen the Docker layer, and uh, you can you can cross compile the Quarkus application to a native code, what means uh, it would it starts incredibly fast, and you can really save a ton of heap space. So with that. Um, what I will do, I will use the startup event from Quarkus and just put it to that class and document that, look, this is a specific Quarkus invention. And uh, because if you will have to migrate this code to another application server, I would say I would manage, you would manage to do this in, in minutes. It's not like a no, um, it, it wouldn't mean end of your kicker project. Okay, so incredible. So we are we are done actually. So let's see whether we have any questions here. No. Um, Twitter is silent. Chat is silent. Perfect news. So I would say, see you in June, and upcoming upcoming conferences. Actually, a lot of conf conferences. I was invited to Netherlands the next time twice. One is IT. I think it's called IT Rockstars. Rockstars and I'm being. Right? Where is it? Team Rockstars. They invited me on May 21st. Then J Spring. Let's see whether I'm listed somewhere. J Spring Conference has to be. Huh. In Utrecht? Utrecht. Yeah, J Spring with a dash. And. So I'm here with some talks about, I guess, huh, 
kick apps with boring tech, interactive hacking. So uh, what it means is I will hack probably something. And one huge conference seems like Code Talks in Cluj, which is Romania. I think this is even this week. This is not that. Code Talks is the conference. Code Talks Cluj. And I have to deliver a keynote. Hmm. Uh, it is this week. You will find that. It's like Code Talks conference in Cluj. And I have to deliver a keynote. Um, I have no slides yet, but I think I will code again because no times for slides. So thank you for watching and see your upcoming conferences, workshops, or even air hacks in Munich, which will come in um, winter this year because of no time in summer. So thank you and bye.